Right. Welcome everybody to the Seller Labs webinar on communicating with Amazon performance teams. We're very excited today to have about 15 years of Amazon performance and policy team experience between Chris and Jochen. And um, we're going to share a lot of great information with you guys. Today's recording, uh, today's webinar will be recorded. Um, it will be emailed to you, so you will have a chance to get both the recording as well as the slides. Uh, we have a nice little special special offer for you at the end, um, so please stick around to learn about that. Um, before we get started, I just want to share with you guys a little bit about Seller Labs. I started on the wrong end. Um, Seller Labs is a SaaS software company based in Athens, Georgia. Our primary software is Feedback Genius. Feedback Genius is an automated messaging tool to help sellers um, generate both seller reviews and product reviews, and probably something that Chris and Jochen might talk about a little bit, that you can also use Feedback Genius to get in front of pr potential performance or policy violations by communicating with your customer. We also have Snagshout, which is um, a tool for generating um, product sampling and product reviews. And we also have a tool called Scope, which is going to be coming out in um, Q2, uh, which is a product research and analytics tool. A couple of uh, upcoming events that are happening for Seller Labs, we'll post these in the, in the chat box. Um, on May 3rd and 4th, we're going to be having a two-day webinar, um, an hour each day. And we're going to be covering expanding into international marketplaces, um, really targeting on European sellers targeting the U.S., um, as well as um, U.S. targeting Europe. So we'll kind of be covering both of those topics over those two days. Please feel free to join us. And if you love Seller Labs as much as I do, but I work here, so I understand that, we're also going to be having a Seller Labs conference May 16th through 18th in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, this conference is going to be bringing together professional Amazon sellers in an environment that's unique and different, generating conversation um, as, mu as much as education on the Amazon marketplace. So if you're available, we'd love to have you join our conference. Finally, we are very excited to announce, this actually is being announced today, um, as a follow-up to our previous webinar that we did with Feedvisor and CPC Strategies, we've uh, produced a, an ebook on optimizing your private label business and building your brand. Um, and that ebook is available. The link will be posted um, in the notes as well as in your follow-up emails. So without any further ado, let's move forward with getting <clears throat> these guys going and um, we'll get into seller performance. I'm gonna switch it over here now so uh, Chris can take over the controls. Give me one second, Chris. Yeah, no problem. GoToWebinar seems to slow down on me for some reason. Yeah, that's all right. As long as I can share my screen, we're good. <laughs> It's acting fidgety. So why don't you take a quick second, Chris, and you can start doing your intro of you and Jochen, and I'll get it switched over to you. Yeah, I'm going to start with um, what you would be seeing on our first slide, which is our names. My name is Chris McCabe. Jochen Shaw works with me. We worked together for several years um, on performance and policy teams, uh, working on a lot of the same issues that you guys probably have questions about. You've encountered problems with a couple of these teams. Um, I left a couple. I left a few years ago, and a couple years ago started um, uh, called my consultancy e-commerce. Chris, I started on my own consulting sellers who needed a little additional help uh, figuring out what to say when you get warnings, how to communicate with seller performance, and then later product quality teams. Um, it, it was it was you know tough at first. People had a lot of questions, and I wasn't sure exactly how to address all of them. But over time, I've figured out pretty much how most of this needs to be written up in an email that you'd have to compose and send into either seller performance or product quality. 
all that same time, Jochen was still working there uh, himself and responding to emails that you've probably sent into those teams on occasion. So uh, today we just want to go over why communication is important, how to create effective communication. Um, I don't know, I'm going to, should I, you want me to go ahead and start talking about my first uh, slide and we'll catch up, Jeff, or? It's coming. I, this is the second time GoToWebinar has done this to me. When, when we seem to have a lot of people in the presentation, it seems to slow down. Let me know when it pops up because I'm going to switch over to looking at my actual slides. So I think you should have it now. Okay. I've got the show my screen button, so I'm going to go with that. And can you confirm that you're seeing my slides? Yeah, you're good. Go to present, go to present mode and you're good. Yep. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, as long as you can see my screen. All right, do you see my presentation? It's the first slide, communicating effectively with Amazon. I think you're good. I'm good, okay, let me just uh, get settled here. Great, so you know who we are? Get to my first slide. Um, there we go. Ah, how do I get rid of this box? <laughs> the your screen is showing so sh you should be able to click back into your there you go you're on what we do okay what we do so we manage client communication obviously sellers have quite a bit more need to communicate with amazon than they used to especially performance and policy teams uh which is which are the teams we used to work on so you're probably getting some performance notifications maybe sometimes you don't know why you got them uh you may or may not uh understand some of the causes there so we prompt people before, of course, creating replies that they can use to send into either product quality or seller performance. We prompt them to understand, you know, to research and understand some of the causes behind those uh, violations because policy teams are driving most of the suspensions, um, individual violations piling up, buyer complaints uh, that lead to automated warnings that Jochen's going to talk about a couple slides from now. But basically, we're managing uh, their communication because there's a need to you certainly don't want to ignore these emails. You don't want to sit back and uh, kind of let these pile up and have an account review queue. You don't want a manual investigation anywhere near your seller account, short version. So uh, of course, for suspended sellers, we're helping manage their appeals too. Um, quite a few sellers are sort of stuck in this loop of communication where, especially if you're talking about product quality, you're writing them an email, giving them all the information they just asked you for in a plan of action. You gave them the plan of action, you described what was in it, uh, and they just asked you for the same thing all over again. This is something very common that uh, people talk to me about more or less every day. So um, we help people craft those appeals to kind of cut the timeline a little bit, communicate more cleanly, concisely, screen out some extraneous information that these teams don't want to read. You have a finite amount of you know space and time to get their attention and give them what they asked for. So uh, as far as ACE and reinstatements, um, bit more of a trend lately is not to suspend so many seller accounts. Sometimes groups of ASINs or particular ASINs are suspended and they're asking you for a plan of action or a POA just for that one ASIN uh, and maybe for one or two uh, uh, categories of concern, you would say. Maybe uh, incomplete orders, used, sold as new. A lot of people are familiar with these phrases. Uh, inauthentic items reported from a buyer. Um, and sometimes there are groups of complaints that you need to address uh, in these ASIN reinstatement uh, emails that you send in. So you might not have that many too, that many cracks at it. You just want to give them as much information as you can and also make sure it's presented in a way using certain words and phrases that they need to see in order to get you, you know, back reinstated and where you need to be. So that's what we're doing uh, communication-wise. Moving on to the next one. I'm going to hand it over to Jochen so we can give sort of more of an explanation on the buyer complaints that turn into warnings. So what you will see or what a lot of sellers see is that there are blind warnings sent out based on buyer reports. Um, Amazon is motivated to act aggressively on reported policy violations. Um, unfortunately, Amazon takes the word, what the buyer says, as the law, the land of the law. Um, what happens is that the buyer has various complaints, like Chris was saying, maybe not may maybe inauthentic or looks different than anticipated. The color is different. It doesn't fit or whatever the situation is. What Amazon did back in the days is set up a automated tool with keywords. As soon as the buyer communicates to the seller or 
customer service in any capacity, those keywords trigger a hit and the system will set up warnings to the, to the seller, um, which then goes into suspensions based on largely non-weather complaints. Amazon, quite frankly, does not have the manpower nor the interest to vet those complaints to ensure they're actually real complaints. Uh, as an example, if you buy a t-shirt and you buy a size extra large because that's what you normally buy, but then it turns out it doesn't fit because it's a smaller version of an extra large, and as a buyer you complain, item doesn't fit properly, you will get a hit, which can turn into suspension if you get various of those. Um, then there are warnings based on the wording or nature of comments. Um, for instance, if you buy a watch and the buyer says, oh, it looks kind of fake, you will get immediately a warning based on that comment, whether it's correct, whether it's not correct, absolutely irrelevant. So that's unfortunately where the communication on the seller's end is very important um, to prevent such suspensions after getting a, a, a certain amount of those warnings. Um, performance and policy execute suspensions. The majority of suspensions are done manually based on the aforementioned complaints. Um, the investigators go ahead and see what complaints were done. There's a certain threshold that is automatically calculated, again, based on all the warnings that have been issued, and then you will get suspended or, in worst case, permanently removed. Also, those teams assess your plan of action. Like Chris was saying, when you get ASINs removed or suspended, they require a plan of action based on whatever complaints they were coming against your account. Um, if you have inauthentic complaints, items not as described, uh, items used, sold as new, et cetera, et cetera, they will ask you for a very detailed plan of action, and then they will assess and, and either reinstate you. Unfortunately, lately, they ask for more information over and over again, which goes back to the uh, loop of communication you get stuck in. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next one. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, when Amazon asks you, what do you need to provide? When Amazon asks you for detailed information, the more detailed information you have, the better it is. If they ask you for invoices, which is a very common theme these days, make sure your invoices are verifiable, your suppliers are verifiable. Um, and if they ask you for a plan of action, make sure it addresses the issue. Um, like I said, the more detailed you are on those, the better it will be for your own future standing. Do you hold back information, have good info? If you have information that you think may be important, it will be important. Don't hold back anything that may or may not be on your personal scale not important. If Amazon reviews those, this information and it could be important, add it. Can you adapt to the Amazon way? That is uh, obviously something the Amazon way is changing more or less daily the way they, they review things. Um, the only consistent is that they want information from you as a seller on how to prevent certain issues that have been uh, done in the past and how you prevent them from reoccurring. Focus on emails as much as metrics. Chris, that's something we talked about the other day. Metrics are obviously something that are still important. However, it's getting more and more to the point that the warning emails or suspension emails are the main focus that Amazon has these days. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people think they should write a paragraph addressing their metrics first and foremost, even if it's a policy suspend related suspension, right? So, yeah. yeah. So the, the metrics, if your metrics are looking good, that doesn't prevent you from being suspended. Not at all. Right. All right. Next slide. Are you looking to have all matters sorted over the phone? I be very blunt with you guys, forget about it. There is no phone support whatsoever. I understand there is the support that seller support has that is completely unrelated to seller performance slash policy. They will not talk to you on the phone. It is simply not scalable due to the sheer amount of warnings and the sheer amount of seller selling on the site. You would have to hire about 10,000 people just for that and obviously that's not gonna happen. Do you know what to ask or how to ask? If you have questions, again, be very straightforward and ask the questions appropriately. 
if you get warned and you don't understand the warning, at least address the issue, see what the root cause for your warning is, and then if you have further questions, ask them. And then, like I said before, seller performance support is not available. There is no support in writing, there's no support on the phone, there's no support online. Seller performance was never set up originally to provide any form of support. Seller performance was set up originally to monitor seller behavior, um, which then added product quality, which is again a seller behavioral issue. That's all they do. They monitor it and take action if deemed necessary. Right. So the more, yeah, the more information one can provide to them, the better it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Simply not scalable. Um, I I have a lot of people who. I mean, I think originally Amazon didn't expect the need for as much give and take with sellers. And maybe as the marketplace grew and matured, they saw more of, you know, longer email threads and more back and forth and also the need to regulate the marketplace a little bit more than they expected to originally. So as, as things grew and changed over time, um, and this kind of leads to, you know, my overview of what I'd like to talk about next, which is, you know, how much attention are you attracting to yourself? Um, product quality teams weren't always there. Uh, they, they weren't so focused on item quality complaints that buyers were sending them. And as, as you have been mentioned earlier, um, you know, Amazon's using those buyer complaints to uh, gain your item quality. They don't necessarily do random FBA checks and open up your boxes and see if one out of every hundred of your items is exactly the way you described it. They're using buyer contacts and, and customer service reports and buyer emails and phone calls to vet, vet those complaints. Uh, those complaints turn into those warnings. Of course, you don't want to get those warnings. Is there anything on your side you can do to minimize the chance that product quality is going to have to either send you even automated warnings or beyond that, uh, generate an account review, which is a manual investigation, of course. Once you get to that point, maybe you've had a few too many uh, performance notifications or policy warnings, and at that point, you're risking a suspension, right, as a result of that manual investigation. So. Um, what is there on your side that you can control that will help kind of keep your feet out of the fire and have them focusing on other sellers perhaps and not you because you're running a tight ship and your operations are functioning the way they need to be for, for the standards of an Amazon seller. So in terms of FBA, um, I know we had a lot of uh, kind of pre-webinar questions in relation to FBA. I have picked out a few, that, um, a few points that I wanted to focus on. Uh, the first one is a bit obvious, you know, are you uh, following policies? Are you compliant with um, all the rules associated with, you know, Amazon sellers? Are you aware of the policies, first of all, uh, the terms and conditions that you agreed to? And also, are you compliant with policies? And, and are you following them? You know, by not following them, by rule breaking, by looking for ways to kind of get around things, are you attracting attention to yourself? Maybe you're doing it unintentionally, um, but is there a way that you can kind of look at your operations and, and how you're running your Amazon account, or if you're not running it yourself, how your people are running it and identify weaknesses that are, you know, attracting attention, attracting buyer complaints. Um, because maybe in the past, you know, sometimes people tell me in the past, we did it this way and we never had any problems, but you know, the present is the present and item quality is a big, big thing now. Uh, so you have to pay a lot of close attention to even sort of the nuances of things like FBA, you know, are there, are there returns, buyers sending, you know, returns back to FBA for whatever reason, but they might have uh, opened the item, they might have even used or tried the item, and it goes back to FBA. If you haven't manually done the opt-out of FBA repackaging, uh, which I recommend for anyone who's getting multiple used, sold as new complaints, especially if you don't even have any used inventory, you only sell new items, and you're seeing all these, you know, new warnings pile up for used, sold as new, you get enough of those, then you'll be suspended for it. And it could be that FBA, well, you haven't opted out of FBA repackaging. FBA is considering your inventory resellable as a new item, resellable inventory, and that it just needs new packaging. So they repackage it. It goes out to another buyer when you have another order, when you sell it again. Unfortunately, the buyer who receives it the second time does not think it's still new the way Amazon or FBA did. So you might have several warnings piling up for that. Make sure if you do, you're opting out of that. I mean, these are kind of the things that you can do to stay off the radar screen of performance and policy teams because the, you can't assume 
FBA and product quality are on the phone talking about all of these issues on a daily basis. There can be a this potential for a huge disconnect between some of these teams. So keep an eye on this stuff. Watch your return reasons. Um, and, and definitely when you're doing FBA, make sure that, uh, you know, your items are properly packaged, for instance. So by the time they get to FBA, they're still intact. Maybe you're selling some delicate items. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of room for discussion there that I'll save for the Q&A, but this is one that I wanted to throw out uh, first. Um, I get a lot of emails and calls from people who are either suspended for uh, notice claims of infringement. This is a huge topic that we could talk about for a while. I'm going to try to uh, uh, break it down into just a few pieces for the moment. If you do uh, get a warning, a notice warning uh, for a violation, you, you want to reach out to the rights owner. They're supposed to give you the email, a way of contacting the rights owner. Certainly, if you can reach out to that rights owner and resolve it yourself in an email or two, then do so. If you cannot, um, in terms of communicating with Amazon, you know, hire an attorney, get some legal advice, unless you're an attorney yourself. I advise people on the Amazon processes around notice warnings and notice suspensions, but I'm not an attorney with that level of legal expertise. So do not send email after email to Amazon asking them to mediate this for you. They will not do it. Uh, they meet the criteria for kind of their minimum liability. And it's really a legal dispute between you and the rights owner, you and another seller, if they're also a seller. Um, they just receive the notice forms if they're properly configured and complete, they process them. So it saves you a lot of time if you don't contact Amazon, you know, talking about how much business you're losing because of a fake rights owner complaint, that sort of thing. I've seen that a lot. Don't do it. Focus on uh, hiring the attorney and getting some, some legal advice. Now, I also wanted to talk about uh, some of the new beta metrics from a communication standpoint because uh, once again, you know, these are new, people have a lot of curiosity around them, what, should, what they should be doing. Uh, in, turn, in terms of like return dissatisfaction and customer response metrics, I believe these are opportunities when you, when you see that you're not hitting the target for those. Uh, certainly, if you make returns easier on buyers, they're less likely to complain to Amazon about item quality related issues, right? Uh, you might be able to head those off at the pass if you make the return process a little bit easier. Same with customer service responses. If you're getting messages from buyers and you're ignoring them uh, for almost 24 hours, you're, you're missing the 24 hour metric. I mean, as quickly as you can get to those as possible, if you can get to them in a few hours, it's probably better than 12 or 14 hours because you might be able to head off at the pass a complaint about item quality that they would otherwise report to Amazon. Though That could be a way of preventing a warning or performance notification you'd get for item quality on that ASIN associated with that order. Um, and even things like the negative buyer experience warnings, which a lot of people aren't taking that seriously at this point. Um, if you see that they've sent you one of these alerts and there's a lot of comments in there, these are the de uh, defects associated with your ASIN. And you see that several of them indicate the buyer just made a mistake, you know, accidental order. Um, this doesn't fit my phone. I didn't read the description properly. Sorry. I've seen just about everything in those. Um, nothing wrong with crafting an email and sending that in and saying, by the way, as far as this ASIN goes, we've done some research. We looked at the comments. We haven't found anything wrong with the inventory. We've looked at the returns. We haven't identified anything there. We'd like you to annotate our account, uh, specifying that we've looked into this. We want to provide the best buyer experience and we haven't found any problems. We thank you for sending us the alert. We'll keep an eye on it for the future, that sort of thing you know, tight, clean, and get your account annotated because who knows if that ASIN will come up again in the future uh, with another kind of warning, then you've got something on your account that they can look at. Uh, investigators are supposed to review prior annotations when they investigate you. So um, in terms of who gets suspended, uh, everyone, <laughs> big and small, um, and, and older sellers with long account history and newer sellers. So uh, in terms of you know, once again, am I focused too much on the metrics and not so much of the complaints on my account? Um, you know, you need to kind of know what's going on with your account. I've talked to, well, I guess large and small sellers that aren't really aware of some of these performance notifications coming in, might not be aware of their inventory quality, they might not be aware uh, of sourcing from a supplier who is associated with several other closed Amazon accounts. I mean, there's lots of things we could talk about there, but Stay on top of it and don't think you're immune just because you might have an account manager 
just in, just because you've been on the site for years, just because you're selling 20 million a year, it doesn't really work that way. And policy teams aren't uh, focused on that when they're conducting an investigation of your account. So um, in terms of invoices, as he was, uh, Joachim was saying earlier, you know, make sure the information is easily verifiable. An online search, they might not grab a phone and call all of your suppliers up the second you send them information uh, about your supply chain, you know, with your supply chain documentation, but they need to be able to find this stuff quickly and easily. Uh, don't make it a treasure hunt. Don't make your invoices difficult to read, uh, information hard to find about your supplier. Do some of the searches yourself in advance if you're worried about it. Um, there are a lot of steps you can take to uh, kind of make it uh, easier on them because ultimately they have a limited amount of time and uh, they've probably read a lot of POAs that day. They've read a lot of emails with a lot of attached invoices. Um, certainly show the results of some of your own investigations internally. You've reviewed complaints and then you write a POA, uh, giving them the information they need, not a lot of extraneous stuff that has nothing to do with the issue. Um, they're looking for specific wording and specific information, and factual information. Um, and certainly, you know, any, uh, tendency you have to ignore these emails is bad, not communicating at all. Um, also, if there's unproductive communication going on, uh, if you're sending in poorly written emails, emails that are talking about something else or combining issues from another warning on another ASIN, if you're presenting the information poorly or writing really long emails that sort of wander and, and don't stick to the point, you're, you're increasing the likelihood that an investigator is going to sort of have their eyes glaze over and ignore it. Hey, Chris, yep. not all of us have worked at Amazon, so um, you use the acronym POA. What does POA mean? Right, so earlier I was saying plan of action, POA. That's what you're going to need if you're suspended. You have to create a plan of action. I'm actually getting to that in a minute. Um, maybe I should have had that slide higher up. Uh, you need to establish the root causes for what went wrong, and the plan of action is how you fixed it. You've presented solutions usually using you know, bullets or numbers, however you wanna do it, but the root causes are clearly identified. We looked into what went wrong, we found the reasons, we found the causes, and now we have reduced the chances that these will happen again, that you'll get these buyer complaints that you have to act on, because Amazon doesn't want to spend time, effort, energy, money, people, whatever you wanna say, uh, looking into consistent item quality complaints against your account. That's the bottom line. They have to protect buyer experience, and also they don't have limitless resources to look into things. So POA stands for plan of action. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with that now, unfortunately, because the number of ASIN suspensions and account suspensions has dramatically spiked in the last 12 months. So um, just jumping back into what do you say in these plans of action? Well, the more you kind of, you know, mess around with the language and uh, you're not sure what you wanna say, if you send something that's not really addressing what they're concerned about, you're losing time. Lost time is lost money. Uh, so, you know, do you need help with some of these appeals? Are you, are you writing them well so that the information is understood on the other side? Um, are you only giving, in, giving them a couple of invoices and not all the ones they asked for? Um, and I understand it's tempting, you know, especially if your account is suspended, it's tempting to just, hit that appeal button, it's right there, you know, asking for you to um, press it and start entering information. But a lot of times people burn that first appeal um, and, and you only get so many cracks at this stuff. If you throw in information, I've seen stuff that had nothing to do with suspensions being used when people hit the appeal button too quickly. They write, you know, using a lot of emotion, sometimes a lot of positive emotion, sometimes negative emotion, commentary on Amazon processes, whatever. That's not the kind of communication they want to see. They will, they're looking for reasons to skip past you if they can. If you give them something totally unrelated to what the matter, of, matter at hand is, uh, then it won't help you and they'll skip past you. You'll have to go back and do it again in a better way. Um, I like to, I just want to go through, um, you know, internal contacts. Who do you know internally? Do you know people who know people internally? Um, is there any way that you can work with your category manager to get some, questions answered or get an email thread going, whatever it might be, questions you have about your category, you wanna maybe expand your selection, have that dialogue ready and going before problems come up because I've seen a lot of sellers 
who start reaching out to their category manager only when things go wrong and they ignore them all the rest of the year or all the rest of the time. So um, they could be good soundboards for some of the, you know, information that you need to pr uh, provide for policy and performance suspensions. Uh, you know, I understand that uh, the account manager program sort of pilot program status right now in beta, you know, invitation only, but eventually you might be invited to have an account manager and that could be somebody, it, it would be a, a couple thousand or 2,500 a month, but that could be somebody that you can get some information from if things are going wrong. Maybe they can head something off at the pass and provide you with an answer to a question before you're even suspended or reviewed. Something like that might be helpful uh, down the road if trouble does come by. Um, maybe it you know, be able to prevent it completely. So these are things to th think about. And who can, you know, who can you talk about at Am Who can you talk to at Amazon? And who can you talk to outside the company who knows Amazonians? So, Jochen, I wanted to throw this one back to you. Thank you. So when you get a warning, sometimes you're like, I didn't do anything wrong. Unfortunately, the Amazon way of thinking is, especially product quality, if they think it's your fault, it is your fault based on their opinion. Um, like I said earlier, if you get a warning, something may not be fitting or the color looks different. They do not vet such complaints. For them, it is your fault. Um, if you respond to those warnings, like Chris was saying, with a plan of action, POA, some things you definitely do not want to do is don't blame the buyer for making things up. Yes, we all know there are the buyers who want to get free return shipping or make up things because for whatever reason. It doesn't really matter, unfortunately. Same goes with don't blame a competitor. Yes, we have seen, and I've seen during my time being in product quality, that a competitor does test buys in order to screw with other sellers to get them off the site. Unfortunately, unless Amazon can verify that this is done maliciously, nothing's gonna to happen to that competitor. So what you wanna do is go into your, into your inventory and see what exactly the issue is and remedy it. Um, which goes then at the end, offer solutions, not problems. Amazon doesn't want to hear that your problem is, oh, the sun was shining from the side, or we had a flooding, or whatever the situation is. They don't care. What they want to hear is, what steps have you done, either proactively or actively, to prevent similar issues from reoccurring in the future, so you don't get A, for the warnings, and B, potential suspensions. Which then goes, just be honest and transparent with them. Don't hide anything. If you have made a mistake and you realize it and you see that there's an ASIN that has been done something wrong, let's say you got a bad batch from your supplier, but you already listed it and the first orders come in and you realize the entire order, the entire batch is broken, reach out to Amazon. It's like, hey, ASIN such and such. We had an issue with this. We got a bad batch by supplier. We had to cancel the last 25 orders. Um, we have removed this from our inventory and exercised due diligence to ensure that this won't happen in the future again. Can you please annotate the account? Perfect. Don't don't have the mistakes. Uh, that goes in hand with researching inventory or orders for potential bought products. Um, there has been an emphasis on cell phone cases over the last six to twelve months. That there's a lot of cell phone cases that are either poor quality. Um, counterfeit um, or just not fitting correctly because they're mass product. Um, if you see such bad inventory, again, research it and remove it from your from your live inventory, um, which then goes in hand that you're going to analyze your root causes of the inventory issue. Uh, this can be a supplier, like Chris was saying, make sure the supplier is easily uh, verifiable. Uh, um, don't use a supplier, some of, of, of Sellers do, don't use a supplier that is like a shack in the wall and no one can verify the address is like a, a dead warehouse or anything. Make sure that when you check your inventory and there are issues that you can analyze it straightforward and can fix it immediately. Okay, I'm gonna cut you, I'm gonna cut you off and I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions because they're coming through. Okay. Um, they're, they're, they're coming through in kind of rapid fire that, that all seem to be around the same, around the same point. Um, so what type of receipts are, what type of receipts or invoices are considered valid versus invalid? So invoices, um, one big focus for investigators is they must be within the last 180 days. That number was set 
by management back in the early 2015 stages. Um, 180 days. If you come up with something that is eight or nine months old, I guarantee you 99% this will be disregarded. Um, verifiable invoices. Obviously, if you are, let's say, a consumer electronics seller and you have invoice from Best Buy or something similar, that's pretty much a no-brainer. Um, in addition, when you sell a certain quantity, make sure on your invoice it matches the quantity that you, that you have in your inventory. If you have an invoice and the quantity of the item in question is one and the inventory on your Amazon account is 150, that's not really corresponding with each other. Most likely that invoice will be rejected. Does that make sense? It does. What about, um, are there certain type of retail, right? So I, I know that like there's certain, like can I, is a receipt from Target okay? Or a TJ Maxx? Or are there certain stores that if I'm doing retail arbitrage that, that I'm going to be in trouble submitting a receipt versus, um, you know, obviously most wholesale and, and, and receipts and, you know, what about a receipt from like a closeout company? Are those all considered legitimate? It depends on the item, quite frankly. Um, there are certain, they used to be, I think the site is called liquidation.com. They have an extremely bad reputation. Uh, not to pick on them. Unfortunately, we have seen stuff coming from them that was verified counterfeit. So they don't have a good standing within the organization. Um, Target, TJ Maxx, Marshalls, all those stores, I don't see a big issue of them. Um, I have seen that sellers just send in a random credit card receipt without any further information. Yeah, those will be rejected. Yeah, I um, mean, the retail arbitrage conversation would be a longer one. It's just a matter of, you know, I mean, some people who have receipts that aren't even line item that just have sort of vague information on it without quantity or without specifics, you can't expect that stuff to be accepted, um, you know, without getting into all the sort of gray market conversation and closeouts, liquidations, or even aftermarket, right. that sort of thing. I mean, um, the short and we've version. Covered, and we've covered some of that in the past. So yeah. I think you know, there, there's information on that. Uh, there's one other question that seems to be repeated, um, and then I'll let you guys go back at it. One okay. was you mentioned a category manager and the question was, how do you find slash contact a category manager? And then you also manage, you also message, you also potential of account management, which is not a service that Amazon currently has. So I just want to clarify that so people understand they don't have it. Right. That's why I said it was in, a, it's in beta. It's in a pilot program status right now. Eventually things shift into invitation only, which is, do you want to pay 2,500 bucks a month for an account manager? Um, but you know, who's going to, I mean, I guess I maybe went a little quickly through some of that information and I can answer questions about it later. Uh, you know, they're only going to send you the invitation if you're not seeing tons of performance notifications or your metrics aren't out of range. I mean, just the same as with Amazon lending or, or other programs that you might use, you know, they're going to give you an account manager, A, if you're willing to pay for it, um, and B, they see, you know, the potential for expanding your selection, maybe getting into some different categories, of course, because that's more revenue for everyone. And, and C, your performance and policy is in line. Uh, a lot of people contact me asking me about account managers. And then um, if, when I become more familiar with their account, I see that they've got lots of item quality issues. They're getting lots of warnings for inauthentic items. Um, that makes the, you know, that lowers the odds that you're going to get the invite for account. I mean, that's sort of the short version. Gotcha. So just yeah. to kind of just to kind of recap, category managers are are managers over the product categories, right? Yeah. So those are managers like over beauty. Um, right. Account managers are at the account level, right. um, and there's no formal program for account management today. But Amazon has been kind of testing and and um, and hinting at the idea that account management um, is potential. And right. I know some other people have asked. You know, is there a certain size of account that if I'm, my account is this size, then then I'll get better attention? Um, and 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 I think the general answer to that is no. Um, you know, unless you're maybe like really really big, like you know, fifty million dollars or something like that, right? It depends. It depends. There's there's all sizes of sellers out there. Um, when it comes to category managers, I'm sure they spend more time with somebody selling fifty million than five is the short answer, but. Um, I will note that even since I've left the company, I've added a lot of category managers on LinkedIn who never met me or knew me. 
and corresponded with them and asked them questions. And uh, some of them do not reply. Some of them do. Sometimes I get my questions answered. Sometimes a thread begins. Um, th there are ways of doing this if you put the time into it and you do a little research. Um, don't just expect them to come to you. You might have to figure out who they are and ask them a question that's sort of relevant to your situation. So. Great. All right. I'll let you guys go back at it so we can try to stay on time here. Yep. 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 Um, Yolkin, do you want me to move? I guess we're in the next slide in regards to the investigators. Uh, let me just finish the last point on this one here. Um, like we talked about earlier, the POA plan of action. Um, if you get various warnings and there are various bullet points in your warning, make sure when you respond that you address each and every concern with an actionable solution, preferably in a bullets format, like Chris was saying, bullets, numbers, whatever you prefer, um, but make sure it's clear and concise so investigators actually can see that you actually, A, took your time to identify the concern, and B, that you presented a remedy to prevent such issues from reoccurring in the future. Um, if you just say, oh, I have reviewed my inventory and it's all good, that's not going to fly by. So the question we have gotten is what motivates a PQ investigator? PQ stands for product quality. Um, investigator metrics are based on how many contacts they resolve per hour, which is also known as the investigative per hour, it's IPH, and the decision quality. Unfortunately, the latter is still lacking um, as it is more focused on how much get we, do we get resolved. Um, the problem is that they move and decide fast, sometimes without making all the best decision and taking all facts into consideration. Um, there's, a, there's a halfway culture of fear of making mistakes, financial mistakes, that sellers get reinstated wrongly and then leading to what is considered a bad debt, meaning they cost Amazon's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, then going back to the invoices, we talked about that on the, over the last slide. Um, in, investigators often say the invoice information is fabricated because they can verify it. To them, fabricated means if you have information that cannot be verified, if the format is completely off, Traditionally, on an invoice, you will not see spelling mistakes. So if someone, and I have seen those myself, invoices get set in by sellers and they are everything but legit. You will get those rejected and this will not be a good thing on your account. Um, the question that we also have gotten is what oversight is there within product quality? Um, there is a process very slowly uh, being implemented for quality assurance. Uh, at the time that I left four months ago, that process was extremely slow and low. So it is still unfortunately that investigators go for the speed rather than the quality of the investigation, uh, which goes back to what Chris was saying earlier in the presentation, uh, that you sometimes get the runaround by product quality asking for the same information over and over again. Or not responding at all, right? Annotating your account and moving on and you don't get a response. Or we have seen that, I have seen, um, that contacts just get resolved. There's no annotation, there's no response, no nothing. Which can be extremely frustrating because then again you get the runaround and wondering what's going on. There's a thing called within Amazon, it's called final word. Um, towards the seller, it sounds along the lines further communication with regards to this matter may not be answered. Um, if you receive such communication, it is probably time to consider an escalation path. If you get that final word message, don't give up. This is not the end of the line. Um, you can hire a professional for account health, account reinstatements. They will be able to give you further help. Um, there's a team called Executive Seller Relations. You can contact them and explain what's going on and what messages you got and that there's something missing and you never got a response, whatever your situation is. Um, and there is the man himself, Jeff Bezos, you can write an escalation direct to his email. And yes, those emails are being read by his executive team. I know there's a, a lot of rumors out there what's going to happen with those, um, as I have done hundreds of those escalations myself during my time. Um, 
Jeff Bezos gets those emails as a question mark and distributes it to his executive team. Those team members give it a quick read and forward it to the necessary channels to get those escalations reviewed by a more senior investigator. Um, and then there will be a respective response, one way or the other. But those escalations are usually being um, not under such time constraints as we have seen with the product quality investigators, as they obviously have a higher visibility to an executive team. So the investigators or senior investigators exercise their due diligence to make sure that the decision is the best and highest decision they can make at the time being. Right. And wouldn't you say, Jochen, I mean, we've seen a lot of people get final worded. A certain number of people will get final worded who, who still get reinstated. It's, it's an effort to discourage email contacts from continuing. They don't want, they want the email queues to be manageable, but um, we've seen several. Okay, so everybody, everybody wants to know what's, what's, the, what's the Jeff Bezos escalation email address? It's, you can Google it. Uh, there's Jeff at, Jeff B at. I mean, there's eight or nine different ones. Um, the, most, the most common one is Jeff at Amazon.com and Jeff B at Amazon.com. Those are the two most common ones that we have seen and been used. Yeah. And those Thank are pretty you. well known. We're not sort of, you know, leaking that. I mean, those are all over Google and they've been talked about. Oh, there was, there was an article on Yahoo.com right. uh, on the business section about that and it clearly stated that it was Jeff at Amazon.com. Public information at this point. So, um, I, I just wanted to, unless you had anything else on final word, Jochen, I was going to grab this back. Um, Go for it. And in, in, in kind of, you know, getting towards the conclusion, if we're short on time, uh, I'll make this quick. But you want, it, you want your best communicator at your company or whoever's running your, you know, Amazon account. Um, you want them the best writer and the, and the person who understands how Amazon works, you know, if possible from the inside or just, you know, even how policy warnings work, the types of things you need to respond with. Um, you need to be attentive to buyer complaints. You need to know why you're getting so many of one certain kind. You need to know why you're getting a variety of them. You can't ignore them. Um, you know, maybe in the past, certain ones you could ignore. If you weren't going to relist the item, you'd say, who cares? Why do I need to answer this? I mean, those days are over. You have to pay close attention to this stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, some people are sort of afraid of contacting Amazon for any reason just because they think, oh, I'm going to draw attention to myself. Amazon's already seeing the issues on your account. Um, you know, that ship has already sailed. You need to address things when they come up and not sort of stay silent and passive and hope that things will go away because that won't happen, not in today's marketplace. Um, so just wanted to give you that. Uh, and just as a quick uh, run through of the offer we're doing, um, you'll see the link here, ecommercechris.com forward slash seller labs. And we've created this so you could uh, look at our step-by-step -step guide of how to stay out of trouble from these performance and policy teams, but also to give you a chance to enter um, a drawing, you can win one out of three uh, email reviews that one of us will do for you. So those three email re reviews can cover seller performance issues, product quality team issues. Um, you know, we're really working with you at that point uh, to hone that communication, crafty an email um, to go into one of these teams because these are the teams that we worked with worked on ourselves and work with every day uh, now. So this is kind of our chance to share our hands-on experience with you and advise you, um, give you some tools for future correspondence as well. So uh, great, thank you. thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Chris thank you. and Jochen. Um, we really appreciate a lot of the detail that was given. Um, there were a lot of great questions asked. Um, some of the questions that were asked were very specific to your accounts. Um, your being the people who asked mm -hmm. the question. So I'm going to ask um, Chris to kind of manually review those and respond back to you as opposed to taking those during the QA. Yeah. Um, I want to kind of focus the QA on some kind of high level questions. Um, some of these were given by people before the event. Some of these were given um, during the, the, the presentation. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start with this one. I, I think it's a I think it's 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 a good one and, and something people have is why is Amazon seller support so poor and inconsistent? The email, the customer support is great. However, the seller support is the worst, all caps. Yeah, do you want to start with this or should I? Go for it. We both have strong feelings on this subject or we've both, <laughs> we've both, we've both read multiple kind of complaints about seller support. 
Um, we didn't work directly with seller support teams. So the answer I've usually formulated is, you know, that's not an area where they're investing a lot of, uh, a lot of reinvesting in the company, shall we say. Um, those are lower skilled positions. They, there might be a lot of turnover. There might not be adequate training. Um, obviously, if you call it this time of day versus another time of day, um, I, I don't mean this time of day, you know, three o'clock Eastern time. I'm talking about one time versus another, you might get a better quality response, um, or you might have somebody who just reads to you from seller help pages that you can already access yourself. Why is that? Um, it's not a priority, you know, uh, and they also don't want seller performance and product quality type issues to be resolved by teams that aren't trained on e either of those two things. They want cases created if you have technical problems, if you need a quick word of advice or suggestions on how to list something. I mean, Jochen, what would you, what else do they really want you using it for? I think, I think what you touched on is the, the fact that those teams are not cross-trained. If you, if you call a seller support agent and you have questions about why did I get this warning, they wouldn't even understand what this warning is all about. They obviously can read it, but I think the, the lack of comprehension is something that will not help you. Um, can I see this as a seller being a poor experience? Absolutely. Unfortunately, due to the, like Chris was saying, it's not on the highest priority list. You can train all seller support people based on how to interpret metrics, what is a product quality issue, what is this, what is that, um, since that's not their focus on what they're there for. Um, that's why they will refer you to go back to the teams that issued such warnings or, or suspensions or whatever the situation is. Um, and, and refer you back to those, and those are the experts that have a, a valuable background. Seller support does not. Right. Well, I think that makes sense. Um, and I think the sentiment of all the people who stated agree when I read the question was pretty funny. Um, <laughs> I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Ryan just asked a really good question. It's a question I get asked a lot, and I'm sure you guys do as well. Um, why does Amazon care so much about their buyers and not their sellers. They need sellers to continue to sell in order for Amazon to make their money, but they seem to preference treatment to their buyers. Mm. That's a question that we have asked internally a lot. Why is it always like the buyer is right and the seller is not, which that's, that's the feeling that I've heard a lot. Um, the problem is that Amazon puts themselves one of the core things to be the most customer centric company in the world. Unfortunately, the way this has been being reviewed is the customer as being the buyer. Um, on a personal level, I think the sellers are as equal as a customer as your buyers are. Unfortunately, it was determined that we need to make sure that all the buyers are in the best position and then we see what the sellers are doing. Um, right. Is this a less than, less than stellar experience? I agree it is not. Um, but it was back, and this has been an, an ongoing issue for years and years ever since I started. Um, that yeah, this I mean, is if, if I remember correctly, Amazon was really founded on three principles: um, selection, variety, and um, and customer happiness. Right? Like it's a it's it's one of the core fundamental um, pieces that Jeff Bezos put in place 15 years ago when he started the company, and. You know, what, what I what I always tell sellers, um, whether it's right or not, because I'm not Jeff Bezos, so I don't know. But what I always tell sellers is the Amazon, from the buyer perspective, has kind of a next man up. I'm sorry, from the seller perspective, has a next man up kind of mentality. That's if you're I mean. not selling that product, somebody else will. I always yeah. like to joke, how many people can sell dog brushes, right? <laughs> And and the truth of the matter and the truth of the matter is is that based on Amazon's philosophy, they believe that there could be thousands of people who sell dog brushes. If you go into Walmart or Target, you only have a choice of maybe four, maybe six brands of dog brushes. But on Amazon, you have a choice of four thousand brands. Right. And, right. and and so Amazon's mentality is kind of like if you're not following the rules, we'll suspend you, and somebody else will step up and take your place and have products to sell. You stole my thunder. I was going to say it in a slightly more cynical fashion, which is Amazon over time has tended to view, let's say, at least certain kinds or certain sizes of sellers as replaceable. Um, if you're not selling something unique, if you're not selling something well, um, of course, if you're having performance and policy problems, you're probably not selling at all. But even if your metrics are great and you're getting item quality complaints, 
the perspective, the reason they've given these teams so much, I don't know, unilateral power over your account is because they are willing to see a certain amount of marketplace business disappear and either yep. be replaced by someone else or disappear completely. They're okay with that. I don't yeah, know if you're and, and I think that it's, uh, um, it, it's not anything that I don't believe that it's anything a seller, you know, I don't believe it's something a seller should be terrified of, but you should obviously be watching your account and know that Amazon is going to, they have bots, right? So there, there's been a lot of questions about how bots um, can can control some of this. Um, and, you know, and I think that leads us very nicely into our next question, which is um, the email that we get from uh, support that says, um, you know, we regret we cannot communicate with you anymore on this issue and replies will not be replied to. So I think Jochen kind of spoke to this a little bit um and and said that's not really a wall that that we should we should have and 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 that we should keep going right yeah that's pretty much what i refer to which is considered internally the terminology final word um sometimes amazon doesn't want to communicate about certain things anymore because they deem the information presented not verifiable or not sufficient um this can this can be done if you have an asin level issue uh, this can be done by your selling privileges being removed permanently. Um, it really shouldn't, for lack of a better term, discourage you to not respond any further. I would offer, like I said, if you need professional help with that or further pushback, and so be it. But unfortunately, sometimes this is what they're going to do. Um, quite frankly, I've seen this to be done to just get rid of the sellers and make them be quiet. Right. So. Yeah. They're, Sorry, they're trying to, yeah, very quickly, they're trying to meet SLA, which stands for service level agreements on the email queues. Sometimes the, the way to do that is to discourage additional contacts from people who may have not been dealt with that well to begin with. So if you got final word right. and, and they didn't really go through and consider and even sometimes they didn't read what you sent, um, then there's a problem, right? So you have to sort of say, well, they're telling me not to contact them, but I have you know, viable information that wasn't considered, I need to find an escalation path. Um, it is, you know, it doesn't always have to be a Bezos escalation, but people are frequently using those now. And then those email queues start backing up. Those used to be extremely rare escalations. Um, but if you're not, if you're not being heard through the main channels, if, if policy emails are being auto responded to, or sort of you're getting canned stock responses, you're forced to do something else to be heard. Yeah, so I'm going to kind of combine a couple of questions together for for and call it kind of our last question, but it's a it's a pretty loaded one. So, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of questions about private label products. Um, so sellers who have their own brand um, and having to deal with a couple of issues, right? So um, either we're attacks by competitors who are posting um, fake reviews, um, downvoting reviews. Um, so what kind of like what what can be done about that and what other types of protection can a private label seller um, put on their brand to uh, restrict others from, you know, from listing um, on their products and 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 damaging and trying to and trying to win through damaging their reputation. So with regards to the reviews, uh, Amazon at the beginning of 2015 launched a team. It's called the Product Review Abuse Team. Um, that team gets all kinds of reports internally and externally um, about reviews that are not accurate or just being done to damage other people's ASINs or, or private labels or listings. Um, if there is concerns that those reviews are fake, you can report that and then there will be a review done by that team. Um, I do not know at this point how backed up they are because their team is still growing and they have lots of stuff on their plate, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, in order to prevent others from listing against you, ASIN, there is currently nothing in place that you can prevent that, um, that others just can attach themselves to that respective ASIN that you created. Um, the only thing at that point you can do is report the competitor um, Sometimes even with a test buy, I know some people say test buys are nonsense. I disagree with that statement because that's pretty much the clearest evidence that you can have. Um, 
and then you report it to Amazon, and then respective action will be taken. Okay. Test buys are important. That's not something to be ignored just based on the short-term expense. And great. Quite frankly, on top of it, if you do a test buy, not only can you report the other party, but you can file a claim against them, which counts against their metrics. But that's just a side note. So great. Well. We're at the top of the hour, and I like to try to keep these um, on time. I can tell you that there are quite a few um, additional questions, so we appreciate those. Keep sending those in. Um, they will be shared with uh, Jochen and Chris, um, and you know we will um, either do a blog post um, or they'll actually respond back to some of you that have asked some specific question, and we'll try to do some follow-up um, on our blog at sellerlabs.com slash blog. And um, we appreciate you guys joining us today. Remember, you can sign up for um, Chris's special offer to get um, some some to win some free reviews. And I think he's also got a little ebook he's given away. Um, we also posted the offers for, for Seller Labs um, for our next webinar, which is really kind of focusing on uh, Europe and um, expanding Europe into Europe and Europe into the U.S. Um, as well as our new private label ebook on building a brand and our seller lab seller labs conference called resonate so um, please take a look at those in the chat box if anybody has any questions you can reach out to um, us directly at sellerlabs.com and we thank you all for attending everybody can have a great throw, day can i throw one more thing out there um, i'm also going to do a blog post on my site uh, once i see some of these questions and the most common ones i'll sort of encapsulate into a bit of a review and response so perfect thank you chris thank you johan appreciate uh you coming on today thank and you. sharing with our audience thank you have a good day